Okay, well, so it's certainly a great pleasure uh, for me to have this opportunity to talk about the work of Jim Simons, who for 35 years really has been a teacher, a colleague, collaborator, and a friend, and uh, to whom I owe so much. So I want to uh, just begin very briefly by saying uh, something about Jim's uh, thesis. Um, actually, I'll have very little to say about the thesis. Um, it's, it's not you understand that it was really a bad thesis. <laughs> um, in fact, it was uh, a very famous thesis. But uh, Robert Bryant is much more expert on the subject of holonomy than I am. And uh, he's going to be making some remarks on this at the beginning of his talk. So let me just say, so Jim's thesis on the transitivity of holonomy systems uh, then appeared in the Annals of Math. And in, when specialized to the Riemannian case, he proved the following remarkable theorem that an irreducible manifold, um, so let M be an irreducible manifold and HP the holonomy group uh, P. And then there are two very distinct possibilities. Either the holonomy group is transitive on the unit sphere or M is extremely special, in fact, a symmetric space of rank greater than or equal to 2. Um, this theorem, uh, which Simons gave an algebraic proof, had actually been observed as a consequence of Berger's classification of holonomy groups by a case-by-case -case analysis with no underlying uh, reason uh, un understood. And Jim gave a very... Uh, a much clearer understanding of what was going on and showed indeed the theorem uh, was uh, had a purely algebraic basis. Um, I guess I should just point out in this connection that um, the subject of holonomy, which of course uh, has become a special holonomy, I should say, which has uh, become a very central one at that time was much more mysterious and less understood. Uh, Jim's work was based on the earlier work of Cartan and then on Ambrose Singer's uh, holonomy theorem. And as I mentioned, there was the classification uh, by Berger um, based on the earlier work of Cartan and Ambrose Singer, um, where a non-intrinsic, so to say, proof of uh, the result on transitivity on the unit sphere had been given. So what I really want to concentrate on in uh, the talk is um, the secondary ge geometric invariance or uh, so-called Chern-Simons invariance. And well, uh, as, as you saw earlier, the official title of the talk um, both our talks is supposed to be the mathematical work of Jim Simons and its influence on the field. And so in connection with the influence on the field, which uh, as we know has been vast, uh, I thought I should uh, look a little bit at the literature. So I asked the librarian at Courant to do a computer search um, and try to find uh, those papers that referred to the fundamental paper that, of Chern and Simons in, in their references. And well, the answer came back, uh, there are over a hundred of them. And well, that seemed impressive and she actually was able to print out uh, the first hundred. And they had, of course, very varied and rather interesting titles. Uh, uh, among the more intriguing, I thought, were uh, the Chern Simons invariant is the natural time variable in classical and quantum cosmology. <laughs> and even more intriguing was on the possibility of a Chern Simons physics on the sun, <laughs> which presumably had not been envisioned <laughs> at the time. <laughs> okay, so 100, over 100 was a very impressive number. Um, it still seemed 
to be somehow inadequate. And so then I, I said, well, instead, why don't you uh, search for those papers which just have Chern Simons in the title? Um, okay, so she did that, and the answer was over a thousand, um, which could by now easily be out of date also. So this was very good because it meant at that point I could give up. <laughs> so, so I won't really uh, say, try to say too much about the influence of this work on, on the field, but of course throughout the conference we'll be hearing about uh, uh, many aspects of, of this influence. And instead, what I'll try to do is to recall how the, the, the birth of, of these ideas, how this um, idea of secondary geometric invariance got started, um, which, which I was around to, to witness from the very beginning, and uh, uh, even participated in a little bit uh, at a later stage. So to kind of set the stage, we should recall um, the work of Chern and Vey um, on on characteristic classes and curvature. And so let G be a Lie group and G its Lie algebra, and we consider on the Lie algebra the it's really a ring of symmetric multilinear and so symmetric means under permutation and invariant under the adjoint representation functions on the Lie algebra. And so that we can consider just given the group, and then suppose we're given a principal G bundle um, with connection theta. So the, the connection in, from this point of view is an ad invariant G valued uh, one form, um, whose restriction to the fiber is the canonical one form on the fiber. And the curvature uh, associated to this connection is an ad invariant G-valued horizontal two-form. So, so this one is actually horizontal. Um, it's not, but has values in the Lie algebra, and it's and it's invariant. Okay. So if it had values in numbers, it would mean really it came from the base. It doesn't have values in numbers, but one can produce that by composing it, so to say with one of these polynomials, P. Um, and then you get a horizontal invariant 2K form if the polynomial has degree K. And that's now an ordinary differential form on the total space, which is horizontal and invariant. And therefore, it's the pullback of a form on the base, which will also denote uh, by abusive language by P of omega. And so for every such uh, invariant polynomial on a bundle in connect with connection, we get in this way a differential form on the base. And this construction, even at this stage, is completely natural. If I have a map from one base to another, then I can actually consider the pullback bundle, and there's an induced connection. Um, then, then I get, going forward, a connection-preserving bundle map, this construction is natural, that is the forms behave naturally under pullbacks. Now, a fundamental property of these forms is that they're closed. And this can be seen by direct computation using the Bianchi identity. So now, you associated to the connection, uh, a closed form on the base, the connection and the polynomial, a closed form on the base, so you have a cohomology class, and of course, for this to be interesting, uh, you would like to know that the cohomology class is actually independent of the choice of connection. Um, and this, this is true, and it's actually a consequence of the fact that the form is always closed. In fact, later, then it's understood in the classical cases that the cohomology classes obtained in this way include the well-known ones like the Euler class um, Pontryagin forms, churn, churn, Pontryagin classes, churn classes, and so on. Uh, the construction specializes in, the, in that way. Um, in fact, for the case of compact groups, this map polynomial to uh, characteristic class is actually an isomorphism. So 
to see directly from this point of view that the cohomology class is independent of the connection. So connections are the kind of objects of which it makes sense to take convex combinations. And so now if I'm given two connections, theta naught and theta one, I can consider a one parameter family. The most convenient one is simply the convex combination that connects them. And then use that to define um, a connection on my bundle crossed with, say, the unit interval over the base space, crossed with the unit interval. And so call, so I have to say what happens in the t direction, but you just extend it trivially in, in, in that direction. So now you get from the one parameter family theta t, a family of connections on this enlarged bundle, which we'll call theta tilde t in this uh, well-defined way. And the naturality of the construction means that if we restrict uh, the curvature form omega tilde to a slice in this product, then it is just the curvature form of the connection theta t. So now the closeness on the larger space, that is to say, we have that dp of omega tilde, which is zero again because no matter where we do it, this leads to a closed form. And now, in effect, we have a closed form on a space m cross an interval. Well, we know that the cohomology of a space cross an interval is the same as that of the space. And another way of saying that is if you restrict it to either the manifold cross zero or the manifold cross one and think of those as being just the same manifold, then you, you get the same uh, cohomology class. And in fact, uh, you can just write down an explicit formula. So if I write P of omega tilde as a tangent, uh, for, as a tangent component, say alpha sub t, plus dt times wedge a normal component, so an, another tangent, well, I write the mixed component as dt plus wedge beta sub t, then you simply get an explicit formula um, that uh, the difference p omega one minus p omega naught is d of this explicit form. And th this is just by elementary calculus, so to say. Uh, the point is, in our case, of course, we can say explicitly what beta t is. Um, so in this way, you get a homomorphism from invariant polynomials to cohomology uh, characteristic classes, which you can think of as cohomology of the classifying space. And uh, this is the Chernvey homomorphism. And it's actually a ring homomorphism. I can multiply polynomials and in, a, in a suitable way, even if they're Lie algebra valued. And you can multiply cohomology classes. And you get this ring homomorphism, which for, say, compact groups is actually an isomorphism and otherwise uh, need not be either surjective or injective. OK. So now we can go a step further with this. And we consider a special case. Namely, if you start with a bundle, you can view the map pi, the projection. You can, so to say, write that same map horizontally. And then look at the induced bundle, pi star of E. And what this really means is, since you can pull back a bundle, you pull it back to its own total space. And there, it becomes canonically trivial. Because a principal bundle is trivial if and only if it has a section. And this one has a canonical tautologous section. So not only is it trivial when pulled back to its own total space, but it, it's canonically trivial. And therefore, on that pulled back bundle to the total space, there is a canonical globally flat connection, namely the one that makes the canonical section parallel. Okay. So it's canonically trivial when pulled back to the total space. And therefore, there's a globally parallel uh, connection theta naught whose curvature, uh, in any case, um, is identically zero. And so the previous discussion shows that if I look at p omega upstairs, which after all was where it started before I pushed it downstairs, upstairs the previous discussion says that that form is, connect is exact and in fact canonically exact. Okay, at least modulo the choice of homotopy uh, between your uh, connection that you started with and the trivial connection. Okay, just 
specializing the previous discussion. And if you write everything that you did out explicitly, namely the formula for the curvature of the connections in your one parameter family, you get an explicit formula which looks like this one. Now, okay, so uh, notice that so far uh, I've been talking about churn Bay theory and uh, Jim, what Jim told me at the time, and actually I called churn yesterday to be sure of this, was that maybe not quite in this formulation, but this fact, which after all is also known from, from topology, the corresponding fact, that the characteristic forms, when pulled back to the bundle, become exact, was, was known to churn, as he always says, m maybe by playing around um, with uh, the calculation. But uh, the thing is that um, nobody ever uh, understood that these forms were good for anything. I mean, of course, the notion of transgression was a well-known uh, notion and played an important role, but nobody really uh, uh, understand, understood that the forms, which are now called uh, TP theta, T for transgression, uh, had any real independent interests uh, in their own right. So the realization that, this, that there could be a use for these forms um, started with Simon's idea uh, concerning an, another uh, problem. And so I remember very well, uh, I was in Berkeley the year 67, 68, and Jim came out for this famous uh, uh, global analysis conference in the summer of 68, and he was extremely excited about uh, a certain problem, and that problem was the one of trying to find a combinatorial formula for Pontryagin classes, and the first basic case, if you could do it, would give you a formula for the signature of a four manifold. Um, and his idea was, well, uh, you should have these forms and then using the triangulation somehow try to parallelize uh, your four manifold. Um, you won't succeed in general, of course, because it won't be parallelizable, but then you should get Using the triangulation, you can think of a triangulation at least gives you a canonical vector field, which you can then use to get the Euler characteristic, and this is very much in the spirit of proof, Chern's proof of the gauss bonnet formula. Use the triangulation to construct a singular framing of the manifold, um, and then uh, try to somehow compute residues using these TP forms. And this was really the first uh, idea of how these forms should play a role. Okay. Now what wasn't so clear was how you would actually construct this framing and this was not really so canonical because uh, it's not like a primary obstruction so to say and so then you started having to try to move the two skeleton around. At one point Jim had the idea that it should be the linking, the signature should be the self-linking of the two skeleton which of course is not so far from the truth since it is the signature of the quadratic form in the middle dimension, but uh, this approach, which I also uh, tried at the time at his urging, um, never quite uh, worked. And this problem of the combinatorial uh, formula, although it's had a number of solution since then is still in many ways quite mysterious. So it was a great problem and continues to be a great problem even though it's been solved more than once. Um, but the greatest thing that came out of it was getting uh, Jim to look at these transgression forms. And so naturally this was 68 and it was Berkeley and so he talked to Chern about this who was the great expert on characteristic forms and the rest, as they say, is history. So now I would like to uh, start talking about what came out of those discussions. And the famous paper, the basic reference, is the paper of Chern and Simons um, in the Annals of Man, 1974. So, um, as you can see, there's a considerable gap in time here 
and there were certain parallel developments that took place during uh, this period, um, which I'll uh, which I'll get to. Okay, so there was some, there was at least another branch, so to say, of the same kind of work that was was going on, uh, which I will get to um, by Jim. And uh, uh, but first, let me talk about what was actually in the paper of, of Chern Simons. So. So there, the, these TP forms uh, took center stage. And so the first point is that there are these forms which are canonical up to exact forms. This you can see by looking at the universal bundle. Um, so they are natural. And by looking at the universal bundle, the cohomology of whose total space uh, is trivial, uh, you see that these are unique up to exact form. So in particular, when you took that homotopy, um, you take a specific one to get a nice formula, but if you took some other one, it would change at most by an exact form. So this was one point. Another point was that in a certain sense, there is a kind of product structure. So if I have two polynomials, P and Q, um, the TP form is, has degree one less, so if I multiply them together, they have to multiply in a funny way because the, I don't just want something which is the sum of the degrees of the TP forms, but one more than that. And so there was, however, this thing which looked like a multiplication of these forms and up to exact forms, one has this kind of product. So the one that makes P times Q exact is TP times Q of theta times Q of omega or in the opposite uh, direction. You can write it as well, up to exact forms. So already a kind of ring structure on these secondary objects is in the picture. And then another point was this one, that sometimes, not, not always of course, not typically, but in well-defined and very interesting cases, you actually do get a closed form. Okay, out of this. So, for instance, if the dimensions were such that the base had odd dimension and you considered a TP form which was just at the top, then the corresponding characteristic form would be over the top, but it's the pullback of something from the base, and therefore, even upstairs, it's zero because it's the pullback of zero. So, in that case, you do get a closed form. Um, the cohomology class depends on the connection. So it's not like a characteristic form um, in this case, not in, not in this degree of generality. Um, it depends on the, the connection in this very interesting case, but this is not bad. So it's not a topological invariant, it's a geometric invariant and a new geometric invariant, um, who, which turned out to be uh, a very significant one. And, and then, so here's where I get slightly ahead of the story. Another point which you find in the paper of Chern and Simons is that if um, the characteristic form, for whatever reasons, dimensional or otherwise, it could be that we were talking about a locally flat connection here, which was not globally flat, for example. Um, if the characteristic form is zero, then when reduced mod z, um, so you get a cohomology class which modulo integral classes is the pullback of a class in the base. So that is to say, if I get a closed form, I view it not as a real class, but allow an integer ambiguity, make it an R mod z class, um, that is reduce it, then it's the pullback of a class in the base. Um, so this is quite a shift in the point of view. As I say, this was six years later, and there were very significant intervening uh, developments, which I'll get to momentarily. Um, now, so in particular, in particular, to an oriented three-manifold, you can, in a very direct way, associate a number. So this was a kind of amazing thing. 
that uh, uh, the, this number is, is a global invariant of the three manifold. It's some mysterious measurement of the geometry. And uh, it was completely new. And this is because an oriented three manifold uh, happens to have a framing. Now the framing is not quite unique, but the ambiguity due to different choices of framings is just an integer. So there's a well-defined number in R mod Z. And Jim, who always uh, in typical visionary fashion put great emphasis on conformal invariants, certainly observed early on and emphasized that this number is a conformal invariant. <coughs> and so in fact more generally if you are in the Riemannian case talking about Riemannian connections on the, pr on the frame bundle and you make a conformal change of metric then these TP forms change by exact forms and there are also inverse forms which you can think of in the sense roughly of the Whitney sum formula, which you can define, which should somehow correspond and, and do, can be, do precisely correspond to the forms of the inverse bundle. So we know that bundles have inverses at the topological level. There's also a notion of inverse connection, such as when you have the normal bundle to an immersion. Um, and this led actually to conformal non-immersion theorems, um, which, which were definitely new. And in particular, I remember uh, something about the genesis of this idea. Uh, Jim and I were on a plane traveling to uh, Minnesota, and he was telling me about this. And naturally, as is always his bent, he wanted to calculate these numbers in some case that he could calculate them. And he said, well, uh, I calculated it for three manifolds immersed in R4, but it's not interesting. It's, it's just, you just get zero. I said, well, isn't that a theorem? <laughs> it turned out it was a theorem. It was his theorem, but he didn't realize yet he had proved it. <laughs> okay, so now, as, as, I'm, as I've indicated, uh, sort of parallel to uh, the uh, work of Chern and Simons, there was a kind of parallel development that emphasized more what was going on in the base. And I first learned about this in a letter from Jim. Um, I was in Brazil. Jim was in Mexico at the time. And this was in, as I reconstruct it, essentially April of 1971. Jim typically was very excited. And, <laughs> and here's what he said. So maybe a little hard to read, but I hope it's legible. So the letters in the spirit of an announcement, the real letter will follow. And he talks about how mathematics is going. For him, it's going very well. And uh, the basic realization is that when the forms are uh, closed. That is when the characteristic form, for instance, is identically zero, then this fact that this was the first indication that the TP forms, which were just formed in the bundle, actually come from classes in the base when reduced mod Z. And, and this is, moreover, these classes are well defined, he says, at least up to Stiefel Whitney classes, and he notices that it changes everything. It changes completely the point of view because somehow the idea that you had forms and variants that only lived in the principal bundle, I mean, sometimes, like in the three manifold case, you could get them into the base by what seemed to be uh, accidental uh, reasons. Now, in general, in, in, in greater generality came from the base was quite uh, a revelation and he was very excited by it and uh, so now he says that uh, there's a point in the circle for a 4k minus 1 manifold general, generalizing the point uh, in the circle that he associated to the 3 manifold and uh, somewhere 
maybe it was on the previous one, he was very excited and was going to spend two weeks in Berkeley talking to Chern about it, and so on. And maybe I also call your attention to this part over here, if it's reasonable. It says, in foliations, for example, the natural connections of bot in the principal bundle actually give rise to circle classes in M. Now this is in 1971, and actually the fact that there exist such foliation classes we uh, had noticed because uh, considerably earlier. Um, my recollection is in 1969. Uh, see, I knew about the bot uh, connections because of my work with uh, Paul Baum, so I was familiar with bot's uh, connections um, for the, the foliations, and I pointed this out um, to Jim as one case where you could get cohomology classes. And this was actually prior to the work of Go Beyond Ve. We discussed this with Tony Phillips. Uh, of course, there were many, many things. Uh, this was an exciting development. There were many things going on, and by the time uh, it actually appeared, of course, everyone else had caught on, and it was a huge industry uh, at that time. Okay. So, uh, Jim, with his penchant for s trying to understand things in a fundamental way, actually understood that if, uh, that it wasn't just when you had a cohomology class that if you looked at it in the right way, these invariants could always, always really lived in the base, provided you reduce mod z. And he, to, in order to do this, he had to invent uh, an entirely new mathematical object. Uh, and this appeared in, and those are the so-called differential characters, and this appeared in a preprint, um, which was part two of the paper with Chern, but written by Jim, characters associated to a connection. Uh, the preprint actually was never published. Um, but in this preprint uh, was the notion, uh, this, this new notion of differential character, um, which was what you needed to do to make these live in the base appear. So what's a differential character? Um, so you consider, for, so this is a purely topological or differential topological notion, actually, um, which turned out to be the right one um, for studying these invariants in uh, their natural context, and it was, a new notion was actually required. So you consider the singular I cycles, so let's say, on a manifold, and then you consider a character on them, which means character in the sense of a homomorphism to R mod Z. So that's a character. Um, or more generally, we could say R mod lambda, where lambda is a proper s subring of the reals. Um, but let's just stick to the integers for purposes of exposition. Sometimes you also wanted to consider Q, by the way, the rationals. So not just any homomorphism or character of the cycles, but you assume that there exists an I-form omega, uh, probably an I plus one form omega. So this, this looks like a misprint, an I plus one form omega, um, such whose co-boundary, so that, so that the co-boundary of your character um, S is the mod Z reduction of a differential form. So in other words, usually, you're used to talking about the co-boundary of a co-chain, but actually, you just, when you take the co-boundary, you evaluate your uh, function on boundaries. So if you can evaluate it on cycles, you can certainly evaluate it on boundaries, and it makes sense to talk about the co-boundary of a function on cycles. And uh, the condition was that there should be a differential form um, which agrees with this co-boundary. The co-boundary is a differential form when you reduce mod z. Okay. And, well, when you reduce a sort of continuous object like a form mod z, um, you don't really lose anything. So there is no ambiguity. So it turns out that uh, this, character, this differential form is actually uniquely determined, and roughly speaking, because it's a co-boundary, it's closed. So associated to a differential character is a closed form, in dimension higher. And then it turns out, if you look into things more carefully, um, as Jim has always wanted to do, you realize that there's also an integral class, 
that's determined by this character. So it, can, it determines, so this object determines not only a form, uh, but also an integral class in the same degree, one higher than the dimension of the character. And with the property that, if I look at the real image of the integral class, that is tensor the coefficients with R, uh, that this is in the same cohomology class as the differential form. So the differential form has more information than a real cohomology class because it's geometric. And an integral class has more information because it can capture torsion. And this is the compatibility between the two. So a character has all this juice in it. And however, it's actually more than that. So uniquely associated to a differential character is a form and an integral class which are compatible in the sense image of the integral class is the Durham class of the form. Form is closed. But this pair, omega comma u, does not determine the character uniquely and the ambiguity is specified now uniquely by uh, an R mod z cohomology class. And so the characters fit in the middle of a nice exact sequence where on one side is uh, an object made up of such pairs which are compatible and the kernel of the resulting map is R mod z cohomology. And so there were these remarkable new objects which turned out to be the right objects um, for putting the TP forms in the base. Um, this was, uh, Jim was really, thought this was great. And somehow, uh, maybe it hasn't been completely used or appreciated uh, by all the people who've uh, applied this uh, since. Um, of course, there, there were many applications of these classes, in particular to flat bundles and so on, but maybe there could still be more. So now, these are the objects. We haven't said anything about bundles with connection. Now let's return to bundles with connection. So we take a Lie group with finitely many components, an invariant polynomial as before. Um, so we have the Chern-Weil theory, the characteristic form P of omega as before. We consider a cohomology class, a universal characteristic class, that is a class in the classifying space, which satisfy the compatibility condition, P of omega equals the real image of U. And then the claim is that there's a naturally associated differential character, um, SPU. And this has the property that when now in general, even if the TP form was not closed, if you pull it back to the total space, it's the mod z reduction of the TP form viewed as a character. So this character is a differential form, reduced mod z on the total space, but not downstairs. So these, and of course, under the previous two maps, they give you, the character gives you back both the form and the integral class. So these now were a new kind of object living in the base, a geometric invariant, um, generalizing the uh, Chern-Weil theory, and they were probably the first geometric invariants, um, which are global invariants. They're not given by ca canonical local expression like the form P of omega. Right? These are genuinely global invariants, but they are just slightly global in the sense that the difference of two is is local, or one could say, if you look at what happens when you change the connection, um, then the expression for the derivative or the variation is local in the difference form of the connections and the curvature of the connection at which you're differentiating. So they just have, it's like an exact sequence that doesn't split, so it has this one little kind of global topological piece in it, and then otherwise um, it's local. Uh, the global topological piece is, of course, very important. And the simplest example, uh, one which Jim liked very much, uh, was the case of a U1 bundle with connection. The simplest thing, a complex line bundle, or you could think of uh, an oriented two-plane bundle. And then there's a character corresponding to the first churn class, or in the real case, the Euler class. And you can say just what it is, and it's uh, just the holonomy around a closed curve. So if you consider a cycle, which a one-dimensional cycle uh, 
They're generated by closed curves, and so it should assign a number mod z to a closed curve. What could it be? It could only be the holonomy around the closed curve, which is a number mod z. Well, there was one thing that seemed to uh, be missing, at least at this point, which bugged Jim a lot, and that was that, as I mentioned earlier, you can multiply forms and cohomology classes. So they formed a ring, and the churn bay homomorphism was a ring homomorphism. Okay. But it w and you could multiply TP forms in, in this funny way, where you had TP uh, wedge P uh, wedge Q of omega, TP theta wedge Q of omega to get in the right degree, and this was well-defined modulo exact forms. Uh, but it wasn't so obvious, uh, you kept running into p trouble if you uh, tried to multiply uh, these characters. And um, in particular, Jim saw that there should be a kind of Whitney sum formula and so on, everything involving the characters. And it wasn't clear how to multiply the characters. So he kind of ordered me to multiply characters. <laughs> and there was just there was one trick involved, which involved subdivision, and I was able to see how to do this in an obscure paper, um, and uh, this made Jim happy. And so there is this this paper in, into in which the star product, so-called, of differential characters, which had the right properties, was introduced. So it made the characters into a ring without reference to anything about characteristic classes, but it was the right notion in this context. And another observation in that, pa in that paper um, was that differential characters can actually be represented by forms with singularities, although not canonically. Um, so what you can think is that it's got a differential form part, then it's got some singularities, and if you look somehow uh, at a, a, an appropriate residue at the singularities, it encodes the integral class, whereas D of the form part, if you just take D on the non-singular, where this I form is non-singular, you get an I plus one form, which is actually smooth, and the integral information is encoded at the singularity. Um, and in terms of this representation, there is a nice product, uh, a nice product formula. You can see what the product is. Uh, very clearly in terms of the representation, in terms of forms with singularities. Uh, I think Jim was never that crazy about the forms with singularities uh, because it was somehow non-canonical and he loved the fact that you could really get them into the base as something very canonical. Um, well, well, uh, well, they're not completely obvious. They take some proof, that's all I can say. I mean, but they're... Well, it is associative, and it's commutative with the appropriate sign. It is associative. All these properties take some proof. Um, and the main point was that if you wrote, so to say, the obvious formula, there was some incompatibility. Differential characters, like differential forms, are invariant under subdivision, right? Because they're functions on cycles. With, you can see from the co-boundary property that they're invariant under subdivision. And the trick was to make the obvious expression, which wouldn't give you something, say, that was associative and so on, invariant under subdivision by subdividing and taking a limit. So, okay, so then the characters were developed further in a paper of Simon's and myself, which uh, somehow, uh, I guess, was incorporated the star product and some other things I'll mention, and was probably the reason why uh, Simon's preprint was never published. And the fact of the matter is that uh, this paper was almost never published either. <laughs> so in fact, this was distributed widely at the Stanford Summer Institute in 1973, um, but uh, uh, somehow we wanted to take it further and there was a particular problem that was bugging us, which I'll get to in a second. And well, it just wasn't really published for a long time, although widely circulated and finally appeared in 1985. Um, part of that period, Jim was busy with other concerns. Um, this work was reported on, I think we both talked about it, at the Vancouver ICM in 1974.
So here were, are some of the new points uh, that were in our joint paper. Um, so now you get the clean statement that the classical Ve homomorphism has a lift, as a ring homomorphism to the ring of differential characters. So really the Ve homomorphism should go through the ring of differential characters and then when you look at the integral class in the form, you return back to the previous one, but the actual, uh, the, the more fundamental thing uh, should go through the characters and that carries more information as we saw before. Now with the product formula, um, there was, as Jim insisted, there must be a natural Whitney sum formula. And another thing that was in that paper was um, an intrinsic construction of the characters that in a sense generalize the, you could think of either the angle of Holonomy construction or uh, uh, the Euler character construction, which in the case of the Euler class, you could understand rather directly what it was in, t in terms of Chern's proof of the gauss bonnet theorem, right? Where to make the Euler class exact, you think in terms of obstruction theory, it becomes exact not just on the principal bundle, but on the unit sphere bundle. So there are corresponding obstruction theory characterizations of characteristic uh, classes, Chern and Pontryagin classes, and these were done in the paper to give intrinsic constructions. Whereas the previous, the existence proof uh, previously had been via the, unit, the fact that these existed and were well defined, had been uh, via the uh, existence of universal bundles and universal connections. And this was initially the way Jim showed that these things existed and well defined. And amazingly, he told me at the time that he thought it was the hardest thing he had ever done, this computation which I thought was particularly amazing and didn't really believe uh, after his work on the Simons equation and minimal uh, varieties. But um, another point was that we saw in this paper that you could actually give a much softer uh, one page, a completely soft proof, again using universal bundles of the existence. That was another thing that was in this paper. And uh, on the other hand, in the classical cases, so to say, you could give intrinsic constructions that didn't use universal bundles. And then, well, in certain cases, so now we finally discussed the Armand Z classes for foliations. And for instance, in the case of a flat bundle, where clearly the form vanishes, you now get Armand Z cohomology classes, um, which can be thought of as characteristic classes of the compact Lie group, but not with its usual topology, but with the discrete topology. And these classes, uh, uh, of course there are mod Z, they can't be continuous, so to say, in the appropriate sense, but they are what are uh, called R mod Z uh, Borel classes of flat bundles. And these R mod Z Borel classes, um, contrary to the impression uh, formed by a certain female acquaintance of Jim at the time were not named in honor of the famous professor at the Institute for Advanced Study, Armand Z. Burrell. <laughs> <laughs> so we have in the paper then uh, these ex when you looked at the explicit co-cycles um, in, uh, the, the explicit formulas, the intrinsic construction, specialized to the flat case, you could make a variation on that idea and think of them, put them in the bar resolution, and what you got was the connection between uh, such uh, uh, characteristic classes of flat bundles and the volumes when you actually constructed these sections using, say, triangulations or something, volumes of spherical and hyperbolic simplices. Now, it's more well known these days, although this is a very old subject, that these are connected to things like higher logarithms, the vol volume formulas for such things. And um, this is uh, a very, uh, well, it's a very deep area, which there have been further developments probably uh, Block may say something about this, I don't know. Um, but it led to a couple of things. So one thing that was amazing to me at the time was to find out about the work of 
Schlafly on these volumes of hyperbolic simplices. And this was uh, work that was obviously very well before its time. In the 1860, he was already considering this problem and had all sorts of formulas and theorems. This is remarkable uh, deep work. It was just amazing to find out about it. And the problem that suggested it, so we wanted actually, one of the uses that we wanted was to use the R mod Z invariants um, to prove that certain homology groups of Lie groups made discrete were infinitely generated. And the, w the idea for doing this was to show that the values of the characters on the appropriate cycles, they should be irrational, actually, or very often irrational and somehow independent over the rationals. Now, it turned out that on the one hand, we were able to get around this by using real classes and a certain algebraic trick, using automorphisms of fields uh, whose construction was <coughs> Which, w whose properties were involved in constructing various examples. So uh, we, by a c much cheaper method, we were able to show that the groups we were looking at really were infinitely generated, but not the original problem remained and annoyed us, and uh, it led to the following conjecture. Um, and that is that if you consider spherical or hyperbolic simplices with rational dihedral angles, which you then could imagine reflecting around and building cycles that are roughly, that typically the volume should be irrational when suitably normalized. I mean, of course, certain isolated cases were known, and the ones that were known were all rational. But the conjecture was typically it should be irrational. And uh, well, we got kind of obsessed with this conjecture. Interestingly, I found out this fall uh, from Ruth Kellerhaus that this conjecture also occurred in the work of Schlafly. It's actually mentioned something, essentially this statement. And well, so we tried to prove this. Uh, Jim, having ordered me to multiply the characters, now ordered me not to stop working on this problem until I had solved it. Uh, <laughs> I worked on it. I got very depressed. I mean, he worked on it too, of course. <laughs> so we worked on it. We got very depressed. <laughs> And eventually, I rebelled, uh, <laughs> thereby saving my mathematical career. <laughs> um, of course, the problem is still uh, very much open today. It's a great problem and a very hard problem. Um, so there's one more thing about the work at the time that, of course, I must mention. And that's uh, the, uh, there was tremendous uh, excitement because of the very closely related uh, work of Atiyah, Patodi, and Singer on the index theorem. Uh, Jim and I were visitors at the institute in 1972, and Atiyah was there, and Singer came by there, and so on. It became sort of clear. The theorem, their theorem wasn't really quite proved at the time, but it was a conjecture on which, uh, uh, which was very much in the air, and um, there was a lot of cross-fertilization between these two ideas when it became clear. For instance, uh, I guess it was known that the, the eta invariant had a similar variational property, that it was a global invariant whose variation was local, and they had the conjecture uh, for what the other side of the index theorem sh should be. Well, I mean, as an index theorem, it was kind of clear. And so without going into detail, which is by now probably quite well known, this is another very parallel, uh, Im important and very important and parallel development at the time. Okay, so this is really um, what I want to uh, say about the work, but let me come back now to uh, the issue about uh, the influence. And rather talking explicitly about the influence, I want to try to consider the question of how could it be that a mathematician who's at least his academic career as a research mathematician spanned only 15 years, and whose uh, total output in terms of papers was roughly 10 papers, could have exerted such an enormous and seemingly increasing, exponentially increasing influence over the fields of mathematics and physics. So, uh, of course, there's only really one answer to this, and the, and the answer is that this is an absolutely exceptional uh, man. Um, however, one could try to say something further and uh, 
kind of ask, like, what are, what, what are the characteristics characteristics of Simon's approach to mathematics. And so I'd just like to offer uh, some observations uh, which I've been bold enough to style as Simon's rules. Okay. So uh, these are just my own impressions. And rule number one is don't waste too much valuable time reading the literature. <laughs> <laughs> this probably only is a good rule if you're exceptional yourself. Um, but I think it was always very characteristic of Jim's approach. Certainly he told me that um, basically what he liked to do was just read enough about a problem so that he could begin thinking about it himself. And it was very characteristic of his temperament and uh, his competitive spirit perhaps and his incredibly independent uh, turn of mind. Um, so that's rule number one. Uh, and rule number two, which I think is extremely characteristic, is to always think about what you're doing. Try to find the right formulation of a result and the fundamental context to understand what you're doing. And I think uh, the work on the Bernstein conjecture is, is a very obvious example of this where for a few years he was just kind of reorganizing the subject and understanding it more and more deeply and turning it over, rederiving things in different ways and finally understood it so deeply that after having a few conversations with Almgren to be aware of what some other people had done was able to, to prove the interior regularity theory and the Bernstein conjecture almost as an afterthought. I mean, the, everything was all there. And of course, the other um, example was the way in which starting with a completely different question, which was a very exciting question about the uh, combinatorial uh, formula, he was led to understand once, once these forms came into the picture, he was Inevitably, he had to understand really what they were and what were their properties and where do they live and what's the right way of looking at them and finally understood that they live in the base and so on and that they were very important. And this is the other absolutely striking example, but it was if you know Jim, uh, you know that this is the way he operates. Okay. On the other hand, rule number three uh, has to do with his absolute love of calculation. But it's completely the opposite of someone who calculates blindly and just, you know, is very powerful, can do any calculation and kind of uh, works in that way. Uh, the point with Jim was always to find the right calculation. I mean, he would uh, think about it to find what he should calculate and uh, what would provide the, the insight, reveal the, the mystery that you could only get to by doing the right calculation. And then he was a great calculator. He was able to do hard calculations. And so the second part of the rule is once you've decided what the right calculation is, you have to make the calculation. And this he really could do. And of course the Simons equation uh, was, was a great example. And I once tried to ask him, well, you know, like what's, what's the secret to being able to uh, calculate? And the answer was, in a way, what you might expect. He said, well, I try to break it up into pieces, I keep it under control, you know, not let it get out of hand, or keep it organized, you know, so. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> so that's how you do calculations. <laughs> Okay, rule number four, think big. <laughs> and uh, certainly uh, Blaine alluded to uh, this in his talk, and uh, uh, Jim is, uh, is a calculator. He loves to calculate, but he also loves to dream. And this is very typical of his approach to any of his endeavors. Um, he loves to imagine the possibilities in things, and he can see the possibilities in things. Uh, you just look at his whole career, and uh, it's, it's so uh, characteristic. And in particular, with regard to uh, the Chern-Simons invariance, 
while he may not have envisioned the possibility of a churn Simon's physics on the sun, <laughs> he insisted right from the very start, over and over again, this is something that is very fundamental, very important. It's great stuff. It's a great way to do geometry, and this is going to be a very big thing. And he just could see that very clearly right from the start. And rule five, uh, which is kind of self-evident, is which you could um, rephrase as uh, taste is everything, only work on uh, problems of fundamental importance. And this was all he was ever interested in doing. And uh, it's kind of obvious that if you're going to have an enormous influence on math and physics and only write 10 papers, you better only work on important problems. <laughs> and that's what he did. OK. And the last rule, rule six, is math is fun. So um, anyone who's around uh, Jim knows that he makes everything into a great adventure. He has a tremendous infectious enthusiasm. He can convey this enthusiasm to uh, everyone uh, around him. And uh, just doing math uh, with Jim was indeed uh, great fun and an adventure. And he could um, convey this enthusiasm, I say, to everyone around him. Or maybe I should say almost everyone, because I do remember one uh, instance uh, where he was not so successful. And this was in the early days at Stony Brook during the uh, Vietnam War. Where students, you know, the, area, the, the atmosphere was very political. Students were very radical. At a certain point, a representative of the student newspaper came to interview Jim, and he had the idea that mathematicians might be somehow colluding in the war effort, or at least they weren't doing enough to stop it, or they were somehow part of this corrupt system. And Jim said, oh, no, you know, it's not like that at all. He said, look, you know, mathematics is a big, exciting business. And the next day in the student newspaper, the uh, headline said, math department, Jim Simons declares, Mathematics is big business. <laughs> and well, the last thing I want to say, again, I remember an occasion where Jim was uh, incredibly enthusiastic, and that was when he uh, learned about the uh, Bohm Maharanov experiment, where uh, you observe on a non-simply connected region, this uh, global effect, some kind of phase shift, which he understood, of course, as holonomy, even though the local field vanishes. And, uh, and he, he said, well, he says, electromagnetism is a differential character. End of story. <laughs> so in retrospect, what he should have said was beginning of story. OK, thank you. <laughs>